Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned temperature a lot. Uh, I didn't really hear anything about humidity. Uh, and certainly some places I've worked in the world, that's almost a bigger issue than temperature. What opportunities are there for natural ventilation dealing with, uh, with high humidity places? It's a very, very good question. Um, so uh, humidity is extremely difficult um, to deal with just using natural ventilation. So there are two things. Um, if you have a building that is always um, located, sorry, where, where the location always has high humidity, then it is unlikely that you would even think about natural ventilation or, or hybrid ventilation. It is unlikely. Um, degrees of um, humidity, uh, excuse that pun again, um, may actually suggest that you could do something with natural ventilation. Um, so if you have high humidity at certain parts of the year, and not at others, then you would definitely be looking at a hybrid system if you were to look for a lower energy solution where you'd have natural ventilation when, when it's okay regarding uh, external humidity conditions, but you'd need a full air conditioning system to do dehumidification. The unfortunate thing with high humidity areas, as you'll be aware, um, is that your opportunity for night cooling is very limited, and it's as a result of the, the heat capacity of that air means that the nighttime temperatures just do not come down as they do in drier climes. And therefore, the opportunities, therefore, to benefit regarding thermal comfort uh, are rather limited. So we restrict our attention and our to areas which are not high humidity zones. And fortunately, if you look at, take at a global map, uh, humankind is funny. Uh, we've gravitated generally to places that are actually fairly comfortable. So I'll t I will leave the 10%, 15% of the world of the population areas which have this particular problem, and I'll go for the low-hanging fruit. And in, that's how we make the biggest dent on energy. There's the gentleman in the green jacket, please. Um, modern buildings are often designed to have pretty much the same temperature everywhere, you know, ideally 21, 22 degrees. Um, I work with a group of Asians and Southern Europeans who consider 27, 28 degrees about optimum. I consider about 19, 20 degrees about optimum. And, uh, and we're constantly arguing and fighting about the air conditioning remote control. So uh, it strikes me that this sort of approach would allow potentially a distribution of people in the buildings so that those near the inflow vents can be cooler and those sort of towards the inside of the stack um, can be warmer, and that, that would be a good thing. More people would be happy more of the time. Is, has anybody explored any of that side of things? So it's a very lovely uh, thought, um, but I'm not going to claim all of the benefits for natural ventilation. All right. So firstly, I, I, I take your point. Uh, you can achieve similar things with uh, a mechanically ventilated building by having areas with, that are warmer than others. However, what I would the, the important point is this, is that if you have a building which the occupants have some degree of control over, so a naturally ventilated building, what you find is that the range of temperature conditions that an individual will actually be happy with are much, much greater. So it's to do with the, uh, the relationship of you with the building and the degree of control that you have with it. And that is probably the largest benefit in terms of thermal comfort, being able to play with a bigger range when you've got a naturally ventilated building that people actually have control over certain vents. And that's huge. Uh, hello, Sean. It's fantastic. I'm tempted to say it was a, brush of, uh, a breath of fresh air, but, but I won't. <laughs> um, just my question is, is, is what can we learn from Mother Nature about how animals or even animal structures um, keep themselves warm and cold and ventilate themselves, natural analogues? So it's a lovely question. In fact, there is a body of research um, on termite mounds, um, which do quite an amazing job, uh, where, they've, uh, de where they design those and the ventilation pathways to keep, basically to keep different areas warmer than others when you've got incubation versus actually just the adult um, ants themselves. Or it's, it, so we can learn, we can learn something. Um, and the other degree that they have, uh, that, uh, that they play with, is moisture. So in terms of using the ground um, for, as a result of um, the evaporation of water, and it might not just be evaporation, it might be adsorption as well. So there are degrees of comfort 
which they, uh, they benefit from. And I would say it's still a body of research, Richard. Um, can you hear me? Good. Um, with the Grenfell inquiry in the news, um, while you were talking about these buildings, I was also thinking about fire safety. So in, do you work with people? Is that something you bear in mind, or do you work with people who are also thinking about the movement of air, should there be a fire or something like that? So um, I, I have spoken about um, natural ventilation just for this evening's purposes, through the eyes of thermal comfort and air quality, but fire safety is absolutely paramount. Um, so firstly, one needs to design systems and ensure that you are designing them to be safe, um, so in terms of uh, fire barriers and things like that. However, it's more than that. Um, the, you can use natural ventilation as a fail-safe also to help uh, ensure that places are adequately ventilated um, whilst you're asking people to get out of the building. So, as we know to our peril, is that the most important thing about a fire strategy is not the building, it's the people. And therefore, you design a ventilation strategy uh, so that if, they're in, if there is a fire, basically, that is what matters most. Once people are out, you can then try and basically um, close the vents. But if you did that too soon, closing vents, in fact, what you'll have is a descending smoke layer, potentially, and then causing people to asphyxiate. And that is what we can't do. So natural ventilation, by using some of these modelling principles, can help you ensure that the smoke layer that develops in the course of a large fire, uh, for example, in a shopping mall, where you can go in and design the, the high-level vents to be sufficiently large, the people on the top floor actually do not get swamped by um, the, the smoke, and you have to build the vents sufficiently high, and you can do the calculations using the plume theory and the ventilation pathways. And it is part of building design. It's not what I've talked about this evening, but it's absolutely crucial. Okay, some more hands that were going up in the middle around here. Just in, right in the middle there with the hand up, thanks. Is there anyone else on the sides or up here? I just feel like all the questions are coming from the middle. Oh, good. Just, just leave it for a second. We'll just do, take the one down here, and then we'll get a mic up to you. The next uh, question. I, I wondered about this huge building in Bucharest that was built by Nicola Ceausescu, the dictator. Uh, has there been a study of that? Because I, I know a particular feature of it is not only an enormous building, but he was very worried that people would put poison gas in the air conditioning. So it was built so that every single room has direct access to the outside air. I just wondered what impact, if any, that might have on... Uh, you know, the way the building works. So I don't know that particular building and any studies thereon. However, um, there are buildings um, that I've worked on uh, which have had individual rooms um, naturally ventilated. And in fact, when I say individual rooms, landlocked rooms buried and shafts being uh, dedicated to those alone in order that actually they could be properly ventilated, but without cross-contamination. So healthcare buildings are uh, come, to, come to mind where you're worried about cross-contamination, and therefore the, um, the current thinking really is that you do that with mechanical ventilation by managing pressure differences. However, if you isolate spaces and give them completely dedicated uh, pathways for natural ventilation, then you could achieve the same goals. So th there, are, th th there are buildings designed using natural ventilation with different spaces for nasty things like that being borne in mind. Now we've got a question from the hot, cheap seats at the top. <laughs> uh, my name's Marcus. Um, the problem I've seen in buildings is that if you have natural ventilation or forced ventilation, you get temperature differentials in the walls forming cold spots and condensation, which can be detrimental natural ventilation because then you get an environment which is more cold tolerant. So, uh, so just, I, I didn't quite hear the question. You, cold spots as a result of air descending from walls. Because you're bringing cold air in. Closer to mouth. Because you're bringing cold air in, yep. you're then increasing the temperature difference in the wall. So, condensation. Okay, so if you bring cold air in near a wall and that continues, then what can happen is indeed that you then get cold spots. However, there are two things that, that are important, uh, a number of things that are important. The, if you bring in air at high level close to a cold wall, if that cold wall has um, got thermal mass, 
then it will tend to get cold and then radiate, or it'll be a sort of a source of radiation absorption. So that is what can constitute a, constitute a cold source sensation. The way around that is to make sure that if you've got cold uh, inlet vents, is that you don't have them um, right adjacent to thermally massive surfaces. So if they're low thermal mass, then you won't have this phenomenon. The trick is, in terms of therefore avoiding cold drafts, if you, they are sufficiently tall, even though it's effectively now only a half a plume in terms of doing the entrainment rather than all sides of a plume, you can still get enough entrainment of warm room air so that you don't create cold drafts. But there is an issue if you don't build them tall enough. Agreed. Anyone else? Oh, good, on the side. Lovely. I could just wait for Sam to come with you with the mic. I came to support you as a new director, and I didn't think for one moment that this lecture would be interesting. So I, ha <laughs> I have to say, you are the master of your craft in terms of enthusiasm as a teacher. I'm a teacher background myself of getting the subject across, and I have to tell you, I found it very interesting. That's very gracious of you. I'm tempted to leave it there, but is there anyone who's desperate for a question? Yeah, lovely, there is. One more. This will be the last one, Sam, if you don't mind going upstairs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether you considered... So, um, you've been talking about natural ventilation, but I was wondering about whether or not you considered a sound insulation or acoustic insulation. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> Sound insulate. Right. Acoustic. Uh, when you say acoustic insulation, um, you're worried about what aspect? Is it to do with the outside, inside, or noise transfer within the space? Noise transfer within the space. Right. Okay. Important point. So, if you consider a um, a multi-story space, for example, and this actually has got some bearing on uh, Gail's question too. If you have a multi-storey space where you bring air in through the perimeter and you seek to exhaust the air through shafts in order to get the air, through dedicated shafts to each floor, in order to get the air out of the ground floor, you have to construct a shaft that passes through the first floor. Now, fortunately, Gale wins because in order to comply with fire regulations, that shaft that passes from the ground floor through the first floor needs to be of sufficient construction that it meets the fire regulations. Therefore, it's going to be usually sufficiently thick and built of the right materials that you are okay regarding that not being a fire break source from ground floor to first floor. In so doing, if you've created a, um, a shaft of sufficient mass, you have normally also tick the box, now making sure that you haven't created a pathway for sound to easily migrate from the ground floor to the first floor. And that's incredibly important, not only for just general disruption, so for example, in a school, but also for privacy uh, when you're dealing with maybe a commercial building and you've got tenants on one floor being a different firm from the tenants on the floor above. So you design buildings not only with fire um, regulations in mind, but also acoustic transport. I will just um, say that you don't only have to build these places, but are naturally ventilated buildings, in, qu in, quiet, um, in quiet rural environments in a field. You can do them in London, uh, where it might be noisy outside, but the kind of vents will not just be a simple opening window. They might be uh, an opening, we'll call them a damper, an integrated building integrated with this will be acoustic baffles in order to attenuate what will be a noise source outside that will be otherwise annoying inside. And you can design those attenuators. They're not necessarily very small, but that's why we build buildings properly. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sean. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you so much for those of you who asked questions and contributed to the debate and the, and the dialogue. Um, if I could just ask you for one favour, which is to uh, clap hands and thank Sean for a fantastic discourse. Thank you. Thank you.